It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is The Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Daniel Wilcox. Hello and welcome to the Great Writers Share podcast with me, Daniel Wilcox, where every week I hijack an hour or so of time from some of the kindest and hardest working writers around today to join me on the show and discuss everything that makes them tick, raw and bounce. Today's date is Wednesday the 27th of May, somehow, and the sun is shining and the sky is blue. Heading straight into my personal update, I've had a revelation this week, uh, which has massively helped to improve my mental state. Um, I think people who listened to the intro last week saw the kind of pressures I was putting myself under. Um, and this is helping me with Corona Gate and also helping me view myself as a better parent during the times when I do have to parent my son. Uh, the secret's simple, and it's something that only really came to me after recording the most recent episode of the Next Level Authors podcast with Sasha Black and asking the question, what is your bare minimum? From that conversation, I went away and thought about the pile of things I needed to do versus the pile of things I wanted to do. And while I love to always be moving and putting extra things on my plate and challenging myself, I realised I was doing far too much. So this week, I've shifted priorities entirely and I've taken a week off of working on When Winter Comes while I turn my efforts to my client work and editing videos for the Great Writers Learn mini-series, which I will be launching to all of my patrons on June the 1st. For anyone who's ever edited videos, you'll know as well as I do, it can, it can take time, it's never it's never easy, there's exporting things, there's things not going how you want to, there's cuts that don't go well, it's, it's annoying as hell. So I'm cutting myself some slack and reducing things that I have to do so that I can do the things that I need to do better. I know it doesn't seem like much of a secret, but it has definitely helped me. Sometimes all I have to do is go through my to-do list and work out where my priorities are and what can take a back seat. Um, next week I'll be ramping up my promotional uh, launch of Collaboration of Authors and also starting to look at the launch plan for episode one of When Winter Comes now that the first episode is finished. But until then, I'm clearing my metaphorical desk and making room for the next load of work. A quick reminder that if you want to learn how to supercharge your scenes, then the sensational Jay Thorne is hosting a free five-day online event in which he'll take you through all the principles you need to write and revise compelling scenes that will exponentially improve your novel or non-fiction book. The course is running from the 15th to 19th of June, and if you want to get involved, there'll be a link in the show notes for you to click straight on through. This week's guest is the charismatic happiness guru and co-author of 10 Steps to Finding Happy, Lindsay Weisner. This episode was recorded around the end of March, uh, when the coronavirus was really ramping up across the globe, and it timed perfectly into our discussion of how to find happiness in such trialing times. We talk about Lindsay's process when it came to bringing the book to life. We discuss her podcast, The Neurotic Nourishment Podcast, in which she talks to sweary women and conquers incredibly tough topics. And we go into the best ways to start finding happiness in today's world. Based off the content of this week's interview, I'm posing the question to you. How do you find your happy? Be sure to comment on the Patreon page or the Facebook group and let me know. Speaking of Patreon, before we dive into the interview, I wanted to quickly remind everyone about the Great Writers Share Patreon page, where for as little as $1 a month, you can get access to a whole bunch of goodies and extras, including early ad-free access to all episodes, entry into our private Slack channel, as well as access to the aforementioned brand new bonus miniseries coming 1st of June. It's going to be a good one. I'm, I'm really enjoying watching it back and editing at the minute, so definitely worth checking out. I've also just given away free advanced copies of Collaboration for Authors to anyone in the Patreon group, and these will be available right up until the book's official release on June the 26th. So if you want to get yours, all you have to do is head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash great writer share and get involved. And now, without any further ado, we'll dive into the interview with the one and the only Lindsay Wisner. Enjoy. Dr. Lindsay Wisner graduated from Georgetown University in 1999, and she was awarded a fellowship in child development at the NIH. She received her doctorate from CW Post, LIU, and pursued postdoctorate training at the American Institute of Psychoanalysis. Dr. Wisner is now the host of the Neurotic Nourishment Podcast, a show where she talks with smart, sweary women about shit that matters, 
and her first book, 10 Steps to Finding Happy, written alongside Celine Castrovilla, released March 20th of this year. Lindsay, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have you. Um, I mean, you've sent me a copy of your book in advance, so thank you for sending that. I've read through it, covered together. It was fantastic. And happiness and all of the steps around mindfulness and everything else, particularly for listeners of this show, know that that's something that I geek out quite a lot on. And I'm, I'm very excited to dive a bit more into that and see what we can bring to the forefront. Um, and I guess a good place to start with that is how would you define happy? Okay, so it's funny that you say that because I think... Um... Well, first of all, for the first season of my podcast, I asked every guest that um, because while we were working on the book, I realized that, um, so I'm big into like anthropology and psychology and just how it all intertwines. And the truth is, I don't think cavemen were worried about happy. I think they were much more worried about like food, shelter, sex, dinosaurs, if I've got the timing of the dinosaurs right. Um, But I think that uh, now, you know, well, previous to a few months ago, we had come to a point in our, you know, countries where most of them were, you know, especially in developed countries where you weren't, um, you weren't facing warfare or starvation or any major catastrophe, um, like a, you know, a meteor from space going to hit the planet <laughs> or coronavirus. Uh, I've been watching a lot of the old, um, you know, disaster movies in order to yeah. just kill me for this. Um, but so happiness was like when it was a given. We thought it was a given. We didn't understand when we didn't have it. And we didn't understand when we didn't have to work for it. And it's sort of like when my kid turns to me and says, I'm bored. I don't, I forgot to ask you if I can use potty mouth on this show. Oh, hell yes. Okay, good. I I don't fucking care if you're bored. I really don't. Like, (laughs) you're bored, do something, create something, write something, draw something. And as a result, I have some really cool creative kids. Um, My son is the only 11-year-old who's, like, into cosplay. Like, he creates his own costumes. Nice. And my daughter will regularly just sit down and write a book. Um, And so I... You know, to me, boredom is something that is, it's a gift, it's a luxury, and happiness is something that we have come to take as a gift or a luxury. And the whole point of our book was, in fact, that we really um, are spoiled rotten, and I'm not talking about clinical depression, and I'm more just talking about in general, like, you have to make an effort to be happy, you have to act, you have to do something, and Uh, The reason I hopped on with this book is because there's concrete steps that are scientifically backed up to actually change the way your brain and body function in a way that makes you happier. Mm. Um, And if I could go back, by the way, I would have changed the, uh, I would have changed the title to to, uh, 10 Steps to Finding Happier. Ah. because I think that should be the goal. But then also, if I could go back, it was supposed to be released in September and we decided to wait <laughs> until March. So, <laughs> so that, was a, that would have Beyond your control. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I do love the fact it's, it's, it's finding happy. It's, it's that kind of search because I think, um, I mean, what you've, you've hit the nail on the head there is that there's a general, um, I guess, people expect that happiness should just be bestowed upon them and that should be the, the ordinary neutral in life. Yeah. Um, how, how do people who cannot find happiness, what are the best ways for them to try and approach happiness if you just take a general, you know, just blanket, normal, in, inverted commas, person? Sure. Well, the first thing, you if you can't find it, you should first start by looking for it. And I, I literally mean, you know, our, our first step, as you know, is choose to find happy. And that means deciding to... Um, to take action, to reevaluate what you are doing what you could be doing, what you want to do, what you should do. Um, You know, I think uh, there probably should have been another step in there about being brave because it is scary to step outside of your comfort zone. Mm. And uh, for us, when you choose to find happy, it does require you to leave things that don't work behind and to, um, to discover things that do work for the, for the future. Um, you know, one of my favorite, like my two favorite happy tips are um, 
The first is um, to try something new because when you try something new, you know how we say that your body has muscle memory? Mm. Have you heard that expression? Yes. I didn't know if it was maybe just a dumb American thing. It's possible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, your body does have muscle memory and your brain needs to create uh, let's call it neurotransmitter memory for lack of a better word, which means like, if I'm like, let's say I'm trying a new yoga pose. Cause although I haven't been in a while, I love yoga because of the brain body, like connection, it's active meditation. And that's what I need to get my brain out of my ass actually. Um, but so, <laughs> you know, uh, your body has to, and brain have to learn, okay, foot goes here. You know, my weight should be put back a little and my head tilted. And as you're learning these new things, your brain has to create new paths, new um, connections between your neurotransmitters so that you understand this and remember this. And the creation of those new paths actually fires up all those happy hormones that bring us pleasure. Mm. So literally trying something new, it doesn't matter if you're good or bad at it. It it does have the potential to give you uh, pleasure merely because your brain is trained to do that. I love the, uh, uh, the there's a notion of how the body tries to find its most efficient state of existence. I think it's, uh, is it the DNR principle um, mm -hmm. in which you, you get so used to what you're doing day in, day out, that 50% of your psychology just resets into um, automatic functioning. So you're not even aware of what you're doing half the time. Your body just reacts because it gets so so used to a routine, so used to the way of being um, that sometimes it's difficult to snap out of it. And one thing that I've, I've struggled with over the past, I don't know, probably half a decade or so. And it's something that um, I mentioned before we came on, on, uh, on to record that I've been seeing a counselor now for about five or six months. Um, and one of the things that I find really, really interesting is there is a constant need to almost battle what will essentially become automatic within you and to find the things and to keep things fresh so that you're keeping on top of being in control which seems it seems like a something that a lot of people i guess don't expect when you're trying to hunt this path for happiness this is true um this is true you there are some things that should become you know sort of automatic or autonomous forget that um because that way uh you'll get you'll it'll be a habit and um, once you get in the habit of doing something, it is helpful. Um, mm -hmm. you know, for the bulk of our quarantine, I have made it my point to wake up early and work out first thing, um, because a, otherwise it doesn't happen. And B, at least I've got one thing crossed off my list by 8am. Mm -hmm. Um, but the other side of that is yes, you do have to constantly be looking to push the envelope and learn new things. And that from a therapist perspective too, you know, you can't, the biggest mistake is to think that you understand your patient in one box and then um, stop, uh, stop receiving all information, hmm. you know, because people are complicated and it takes a while. And you mentioned there, obviously, um, we're recording this at the point of uh, coronavirus at what I guess will be one of the peaks. I, we, we don't know what's going to go on with it. Um, and obviously, a lot of people right now are existing in this whole flux of not really sure what's going on. Um, I'm guessing a lot of people are sleeping in late and stay, <laughs> staying in their pajamas all day, which why the hell wouldn't you? Um, sure. what, what are some tips that people can use to try and remain positive and look after their, their mental well-being um, during the quarantines? Um, I really do think we need to try to make a point to get outside every day. Um, my kids and I have been doing bike rides. And by the way, I have not been a bike since I was 12. And it hurts like <laughs> hell. I mean, like, I am really, my thighs are not, 42-year-old woman, my thighs are not cut out for this. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's also something new. Like, I've never done bike riding with my children. My husband was the one who taught them. And then it just wasn't something I was particularly into. But now it's something new and fun and um and it gives me vitamin d and also in that um that new and fun moment is also the fact that yes this sucks i'm inside and i'm multitasking my job and my kids and um everything else but i'm also having special moments with my children or with my loved ones when we facetime or 
um, or talk on the phone that I wouldn't have otherwise. So, um, you know, I feel like if, there are also some special things about this that we can try to look at in a, um, you know, in a positive light. And I'm not someone who always says, look on the bright side, that's just not my personality. Um, but, you know, uh, listen, I have a patient who, who hates Donald Trump. I have many patients who hate Donald Trump, but the one thing she's pointed out is that he is very funny. And it's a way of looking at that bright <laughs> side, of, you know, like, yeah, he's dumb, but I just heard him define sanitize incorrectly four times in three minutes. So, <laughs> um, you know, like there is something to be said about getting outside and finding a moment to cherish some of these times, because instead of running around to various activities and driving my kids all over the place and like arguing about lacrosse and Hebrew school that no one wants to go to, like, <laughs> you know, the end of the night, well, some nights we'll paint, some nights we'll, um, we'll all read. We have a book nook because I needed a book nook. Um, and so we'll all like, I'm jealous. Our, oh, I'll send you pictures. It's phenomenal. <laughs> um, you know, we'll all read in the book nook and, um, uh, you know, today they had to do a virtual tour of, um, uh, the Lincoln Center Symphony Philharmonic something. And so my son came in and shared it with me. And it was a nice moment that I wouldn't have had if my, well, if my eyes hadn't been open to it. And <laughs> if I had been busy, um, dwelling on the negatives of where we are right now. Mm. I think it's interesting because you get a lot of people worldwide who I imagine spend so much time at work that they're thinking, oh, if only I had more time to spend with my kids. And uh, they must, I, I'd be interested to see the, the breakdown of opinions. Of the oh, people they who, regret it now. Oh, <laughs> yes. They're suddenly very, very thankful for, for all the teachers that, that bust their backside every week and try and uh, keep our kids not only off of our hands, but educated as well. Um, uh, this is true. That's been a struggle. Um, mm. You know, it's been a struggle, but it's, I think things are smoothing out and not in terms of the curve. I don't want to talk about that because I'm against that. Um, but um, I think that we have to, I think the same way we had to make a choice to find happy before um, the coronavirus ruined my book. Uh, <laughs> I think we still need to make that choice now. And although everyone is quick to tell me, don't worry, this is a time when people will really need your book. I'm like, unless I manage to get my book up on the numbers, you know, the flipping count of numbers, like every day of the dead and the dying. And, um, I don't think, I think it'll take people a while to realize that they still need to find a way to make themselves happy, even during this, um, frightening time yeah well since you obviously mentioned there let's kick off into the book so the book itself like we say it launched on march 20th which might not have been the most ideal time for um a book launch but it's out there but if we go back a little bit how did you how did the book start and how did you get involved in its creation sure um i so essentially I've always wanted to be a writer and every time I get super close something goes wrong <laughs> um I swear to god in um uh se September I moved to New York in like September of 2001 and I had been writing a book over the summer before graduate school and so I started sending it out and there was a new like indie publisher who had just started and we went through the whole like you know send me a summary send me three chapters send me 50 pages and then like I had the whole book to them and I had spoken to the woman on the phone and I was like I think this is gonna happen and this is amazing and then um you might remember September 11th of 2001 was kind ah. of a rough day yeah um and so literally our economy fell you know, um, not as quickly as it's falling now, but pretty quickly. And this, um, this indie publisher was rightfully so not going to take a chance on a, you know, uh, never been published 24 year old. So um, that was a shame. And then in 2014, I actually won the Cosmopolitan magazine first ever fiction contest. Congratulations. And, uh, fantastic. Thank you. It was. Uh, they tweeted it at me. They were like, we're going to tweet that you're the winner, which is funny because I didn't have a Twitter account because I'm old. <laughs> and so I like walked into a bagel store and handed my phone to the 
young, like the young teenager there, I was like, I need a Twitter account, do it. And so, <laughs> um, and so uh, from that, I did get an agent and, and my agent is great and she does fiction. And then we stopped, we shopped around my book for about two years before accepting that we couldn't find a publisher for whatever reason. Um, and so, I mean, I guess the reason is it wasn't good enough or um, it wasn't the right agent or it wasn't the right timing. Um, I'm open to all, any and all possibilities. Mm. I'm devastated, but open. But through Twitter, I ended up meeting uh, some local authors and Celine Castrovia was one of them. And so we started writing together, uh, like, you know, group workshopping and reading each other's work. And she lives 15 minutes away from me. And her niece actually is in the same school and same grade as my son. So it was just a bizarre coincidence. And then, um, uh, so we worked together on and off for, I guess, four years. And then two summers ago, she reached out to me with a self-help book she had written and asked me if I would take a look at it. And once I did, and I had never read a self-help book before, and I don't like the idea of vision boards because they freak me out. <laughs> I do. I do want to burn sage though. I really want to burn sage because I hear that it gets monsters angry or something like that. Okay. So yeah. I want to clean my house with sage and see the monsters come out, but not the vision board. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, so Selene asked me to take a look at it and it was summer and I happened to have some extra time on my hands. And so I looked at the book and realized that um, I probably was not going to read another self-help book again, but uh, this particular one could be backed up by science and research and data that had been, you know, um, sort of rumbling around my brains at some capacity or another since graduate school. And I thought the idea of a self-help book that was actually backed up by science and not just um, vision boards and stuff was like a really cool idea. So I mustered up the courage to ask her if she wanted a co-author and she did largely because of the letters before and after my name. <laughs> and, um, and then as we were doing it, I realized that like, it's a good question. What is happy and how do we all experience happy? And so I found 24 expert writers to, uh, who are willing to donate, you know, a piece of themselves, so about 800 words to the book to talk about either how they found happy in their own life or um, how they had made it through a different time and their view of happiness had changed or um, just some sort of personal experience that they shared. And uh, my favorite one is there is a woman who works at a pediatric palliative care unit doing dance and movement therapy. So she basically works with dying children and severely, um, you know, uh, brain damaged, dying children doing dance and movement therapy. And she spoke about the importance of bringing happiness to their lives. Um, and I thought that was super powerful. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, there's loads of content within that book from all those different experts, different angles. Um, it's structured in a way in which you've obviously got concrete actions. You've got useful objectives and things that people can, can try. Um, I mean, one, one thing that comes to mind anytime that I read one of these books and it's, it's something based more off my own experience of when I first started reading things like self-help books is what would you say to people who, when they are reading that book and say, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but say that the first concrete action is just to look in the mirror and smile, stuff like that to somebody who hasn't taken that kind of approach or looked at that kind of thing before might find that quite a strange and daunting experience. Um, how, how do you ease people into that and say, just, just give it a go. Let's, let's push and just try and work through some of these steps. I don't really ease people into anything. That's not my style, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it really isn't. I mean, I'm more of a fuck you. If you haven't tried it before, try it now. Um, you know, I, I, I do think that some of these, some of these steps sound so much easier than they are or so simple. Or um, I think our, well, part of our first concrete action was like, get yourself a journal um, and, um, initially my co-author spent a lot of time talking about this fucking journal and what colors. <laughs> and I was just like, listen, I don't give a fuck about the journal, like move on. Most people aren't going to want a journal, but, um, 
but she really likes purple and purple journals. So we had to keep it in. Um, but what I did look into is the difference between writing by hand as you would in a journal and also writing, taking notes like on your phone or typing mm -hmm. on your computer. Um, and it, there is a huge difference in memory retention in um, comprehension. And I did remember back in, in college, I used to have a column in the newspaper twice a week and I would initially write it by hand and then I would rewrite it by hand and then I would type it. And then when I got to the office of the, um, the newspaper, I would type it a final time. And for me, it was that like, you know, that repetition and that by hand exploration before I got to the more formal, um, you know, aspect of editing. And so I think there is something to be said for things that we take for granted, like looking in the mirror and smiling. Mm. Um, yeah, I think particularly when the world is so fast paced and we cram it with so much stuff. I mean, I know one of the, one of the steps in there is to, um, to to dial it back to try and declutter your life both mentally and physically, um, which I yeah is is a very very powerful step. Do you have a particular um, if you were to recommend one step out of all of them that would have the biggest impact on people? Would you have one of those? Absolutely, and I think you're going to love it because everyone I tell about loves it, um, and it's probably. <laughs> I think it's the podcast slash writer thing, but um, uh, find your passion, find your purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was planning this book launch, that didn't occur, not that I'm bitter, um, but I honestly, I was like up at 5 a.m. I was um, I was hustling like no other. I, it's, you know, I was reaching out to, I was probably sending out a thousand emails to celebrities and newspapers and all this stuff. And it just felt, so um it was you know i was uh i was fueled by the movement and by the meaning and by the idea and uh the same thing goes for when i started my podcast it was um it was an accident kind of like we were sitting i was sitting with a very good friend of mine in a playground and someone was listening to us banter and they suggested we start a podcast. And the next thing, you know, we <laughs> like recording on speakerphone on anchor. And then finally we meet, we had a guest come on who explained to us what the word sound editing means. <laughs> 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 um, you know, and at some point we realized it wasn't her passion, but it was mine. And so I continued, um, you know, and currently I've actually started working like literally just started working on a new idea for a book and I, it involves a lot of research into a lot of things that I don't know about. And yet I feel so excited and passionate and like, it's really everything I can do not to, um, while I'm watching a movie with my husband, not to like take out a book or, you know, like to, something to read, to get going. Um, I don't know what I would be doing right now if I, well, I would probably have found a new passion. Um, but like this, the fact that I have this new project is really exciting to me and it, it gives me hope, um, to do something and it, it, to, to do something to move forward so that if the beast, you know, if this book bombs, um, there's something else going on and it's something else exciting and, um, and I think too easily we just expect our calling to come to us. Whereas I think in part as podcasters and part as authors, we have to be used to um, hitting brick walls and then getting up and trying to go through them again. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, one of the funniest moments of, um, of the, the book promo, uh, planning thing was I reached out to the editor at psychology today and asked if anyone, if there was any way she could, someone could pro possibly provide like a little blurb of coverage on our event or something. Um, it was going to be at the air and space museum. So it was a big thing. Hmm. And I, I should mention that, uh, when I was 20, I actually was an Inter, a summer intern at Psychology Today, although this woman would not was not there, and also no one would have remembered remembered me because I was a horrible intern. I was like the, you know, stumbling, you know, hungover in the morning, and like kind of sneak out a few minutes early in the afternoon. Intern. <laughs> um, 
And actually what happened was she very nicely responded to my, um, my request and explained that, you know, they didn't really cover a lot of events, which I knew I was just desperate. Um, but, uh, based on my qualifications, would I like to have a blog on psychology today? And so <laughs> nice. I have a blog on psychology today. Fantastic. <laughs> Which was probably the funniest story about like, you know, getting up again and getting up again. And then eventually the wall gave in and it's now something that is, um, fantastic. And I get to write about whatever, I want. And uh, two weeks ago, I wrote about that horrible documentary, Tiger King, and it got a lot of readers. I've still not watched it yet. I've, I've heard so much hype about it. No, Don't. no, no. Do you, do you like, um, do you value your time? I do. <laughs> do you consider yourself an intelligent person? I do. Okay. Is, is there, is there anything else you could possibly do while, mo while watching it, like cook, juggle and exercise at the same time? Probably not. Then it is not worth your time. That's probably why I haven't watched it so far. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I spent the first three episodes going, what the fuck am I watching? <laughs> and, but I was also treadmilling and texting and like ignoring my kids. So I was multitasking. So I made it through. But um, see, there's so much stuff like this that I, I mean, where people there's a, there's a group culture of you must watch this you must watch this and it, it gets into every pore and i'm there I, I don't show any interest in it i've read the blurb i don't i'm not interested in it whatsoever but there's a part of me now that's like what is the hype maybe you're i have not to watch it to understand no because you're literally gonna spend the first three episodes going why am i watching this show <laughs> okay that ticks off something else i need to do that's fine yeah yeah. Um, and you mentioned there, uh, obviously, lots of stumbling blocks, getting up, getting up, getting up. And within the book itself, uh, I mean, there are no holes barred of um, adversities and obstacles that, uh, that have been overcome. Um, and I believe, is it you in that book that talks about your IVF treatments as well? Uh, no, is that, that is not in? me. That is some, no, that is uh, neither of us. That is one of our guest writers who talked about her IVF treatments and infertility, oh. which is something that... Um, you know, is not talked about enough and way mm. too many women struggle from. And I am pleased to report that she had her little baby girl about. Oh, uh, fantastic. Two, That's three brilliant. Weeks ago, right at the start of the coronavirus. But, um, <laughs> um, but her daughter is safe and she is happy and they went through hell. And um, it was a lot to, you know, for someone to share that story, mm. but she shared it because of how lonely it felt while she was going through it. Um, because people don't want to talk about their adversities. Um, I think it's it's so important to do that. I mean, like I said, the book's full of sort of anecdotes and stories of obstacles that people have overcome. And that kind of transparency, I think, is, is incredibly beneficial for people who, uh, I guess, are trapped in their own bubble of what their life is and they think that they might be alone. And there's definitely um, a massive amount of value in in sharing those stories and being able to just be real with what life is because I think that's probably um, where a lot of unhappiness comes from is this, this uh, expectation that the world is going to be sunshine and rainbows, that you've got your destiny. Like you said earlier that um, you wait for your calling to come for you. And there's definitely a need for a certain level of action in order to make sure that you are, I, I hate the fact that I'm using this phrase, living your best life. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and that sounds like happen. it goes along with vision boards. I don't like it either. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but I also think that you have to do like. <sighs> I mean, listen. You ask me to if you asked me a few weeks ago, or even now, if I feel like I'm living my best life. I think I'm doing my damned hardest to try. And isn't that the best we can ask for? Yeah. Oh. One one quote from the book that uh, the minute that I came across it, I snapped it and sent it to a couple of friends is uh, doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will, which mm. is Susie Cazes. Um And I think you've, you've obviously got thousands of quotes littering this book as well, but that one was definitely... That is another one of my problems with the book. It was that <laughs> and the, that, the purple notebooks, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the quotes, uh, I, I mean, they're useful. I mean, I live, I live my life pretty much by absorbing the quotes and then trying to remember who they're attributed and spewing them to try and sound intelligent. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> I do too, but at one point there were more quotes than pages in the book and I had to put my foot down. <laughs> oh, fair enough. But yeah, doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will. I mean, I don't know if you want to sort of touch on what that would mean to you oh um i mean listen i 
you know, I told you that my previous attempts at, um, it's always been my dream to have a book published and uh, specifically to see someone on the subway reading my book. Um, and that is from when I was living in New York, working at Psychology Today in an ironic, you know, full circle kind of way. Um, but I also fell in love with psychology, like uh, when early on in college and there was a professor who was fantastic. And also now that I look back on it, a chauvinistic pig, but, um, you know, I, I basically, I took like three classes of him and then went to him. I essentially wanted someone to tell me that I was good enough to be a psych major, which is really silly because every asshole was a psych major. <laughs> like, um, but I went to him during his office hours and I, I said, I, you know, can I ask you a question? And I, I basically asked him if I took this one class and I decided not to major, would it still count towards a minor? And it's a really dumb question, which is how I know I was really just looking for some sort of paternal um, approval. Um, and so he looked me up and down and I was all blonde hair and big boobs. And he says, <laughs> don't major with it. You'll never do anything with it. And then walked away. Wow. So in his defense, most psych majors don't do anything with it. But in my defense, fuck you. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a man who also on the first test, I not only he took off eight points because I not only answered the question that was being asked, but I went on to explain like the next step of the uh, synapses of the uh, like neurotransmitter, whatever the synapses and neurotransmitters like he asked one question and I explained step one, step two and step three. And he took off eight points because that wasn't what he asked. Wow. So um, he was kind of a dick. So I automatically went downstairs and because at the time you had to actually do this in person and I just walked downstairs It happened to be in the same building and I registered to double major in English and psychology because there was no way that this guy was going to tell me that there was something I could not do without giving me a chance to try. Um, and also it's not that hard to be a psych major, by the way. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. It seems there was definitely a, a, a tenacity sort of built into you at a fairly early age. I, some of that, so one question, one thing that keeps propping up um, in, in my head is that you, there seems to be quite a fiery dynamic between yourself and Celine. How did your, Celine, how did your um, collaboration look? How did you balance the different parts while you were working through the book? Oh, it's fiery, but it's not fiery. We don't like, I'm, I'm making jokes about things that were, um, you know, were not as quite as serious. I mean, she is an extremely talented writer. Um, she has written a number of fiction books um, in like all areas of, you know, like young adults, uh, um, adults, middle grade, children's, YA, all those things, which is young adults. I just realized I repeated my advice. <laughs> She's extremely talented. She's extremely well-trained. She, um, you know, she has uh, won a number of various awards for previous books. And I am, needless to say, rough around the edges and um, kind of untrained when it comes to writing. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm trained when it comes to psychology, but writing has been all my instinct or, um, learning or, um, you know, co-writing with other people at various points. Um, I also had never done any editing until this, at which point I stupidly volunteered myself to edit 24 people's work. Um, it's a lot. Have you ever edited? Yes. Oh, Jesus. Um, it's a lot. And, um, you know, uh, so we, we each had our strengths. I also think that she's a bit older than me. And so I'm a bit, and I'm not young, but I'm a bit more in touch with like, um, this is my first book. So I want to know how we do books now. And yeah. um, Selene has a ton of experience on publishing and promoting books over the last 15 to 20 years. And so I think that it was about finding a balance between what's gonna work and what's um, not, you know, and what like what's old and what still works and what's tried and true and whether or not we should be doing um, tried and true. But um, 
but it was, uh, I mean, we're, listen, we are friends. We will always be friends. We are in different places in our life. I don't think I'll ever co write a book with anyone. Um, but I'm sure I'll take that back at some point. Um, <laughs> but I don't feel like, I feel like, you know, sometimes I hear people say that like they, one person feels like they did more or they did, you know, harder, whatever it was. Like, I think she and I both did, um, a lot. I mean, she wrote the bare bones of the book and then I, this ridiculous thing with the 24 expert writers and my <laughs> editing, um, I, you know, I took over that, um, and just an aside, the irony to that is when I was in college, Normally when you graduate, you're supposed to get a senior salute in the newspaper, which is basically just pretty pictures of you and nice things you say. And um, I guess I was kind of looking forward to it after like writing, you know, for a while for the uh, newspaper. And then I found that myself, um, the guy I was dating and his two good friends, we all had columns but had not edited. So they said that we could not um, have our senior salutes. Oh, no. So, Yes, it's okay. We stole the templates and put out a fake paper. So <laughs> it worked out just fine. <laughs> when when you were first looking at, because you mentioned earlier, obviously, um, so then sent over the idea for the book originally and, and you had a read for it and then thought you could add the, the, the sort of science back up to that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm massively interested in, in collaborations and how they form and, and how, how they work between different people because obviously every single one is individualistic. Were you looking for a collaboration at the time? What what was it that that made no. you think, okay, I've got something of value to add to this? And because it's quite a big step to say to someone, okay, I'd like to contribute to your book quite heavily. So, what was the sort of thinking behind that? Was there anything past well, the science? You know, it was a couple bizarre things. I had known her for quite a while. Um, I felt comfortable. She would say no. Um, I also, like I said, this has always been my dream. And that summer, my um, my uh, grandmother had died, had passed, had just passed. So she was the person I was closest to in the world. And um, the first Broadway show my grandmother took me to was 42nd Street. And when Selene and I were talking and she mentioned that, you know, when this was going to come out, it would literally, it was literally initially supposed to come out on my 42nd birthday in September of this year. So all of these things to me sort of felt like a, um, you know, serendipity, fate, destiny, uh, opportunity. Uh, and in fact, on my 42nd birthday, Selene got me a little um, New York license plate that says, you know, 42nd Street. And um, it just all seemed to come together. And, uh, and I felt like we would be a good, a good fit, a good compliment because we have such different writing styles. Um, so it was not a well thought out thing. No, <laughs> just kind of happened. It's one of those serendipitous stuff that just, well, I also, together. I also decided to try surfing that summer and I <laughs> felt my back. And so I was a little bit high on painkillers. Um, and so I really thought it was the greatest book ever, which it totally is. Um, but I think that amounted for my bravery in, um, and putting myself out there in a way that I probably wouldn't have otherwise. And you've got your neurotic nourishment podcast as well. It'd be doing it with a bit of a disservice having you on and not doing a little bit of talking about that podcast. Um, tell us a little bit about how that kind of came to formation and what you, what you try and achieve with the episodes. Sure. Um, you know, it started because I, I'm in suburbia. Does suburbia translate the same way? I, I think so, the I, idyllic suburbs. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm in like this small-ish suburb town and um, there's a lot of wealth here and there's um, a big divide between the working moms and the not working moms. And I've always been somewhere in between because I make my own uh, hours as a psychologist. And it's always very exciting to find another um, smart mom who doesn't judge you as falling into one of these two categories. And I made, I made a friend. Uh, we met at a, a dinner through another friend. And then I actually, oh, I actually um, hired her to be my nutritionist. And then she quit because I 
don't listen to stuff. <laughs> um, also, whiskey. That's my weakness. Scotch, too, oh. but mostly whiskey. Yeah. Uh, no bourbon, though. I don't like that. But um, so then the more we became friends, the more we enjoyed talking to each other, and the more we realized that we both had something interesting to contribute to a conversation. So the initial title, Neurotic Nourishment, was meant to be like, her as a uh, nutritionist and, you know, the nourishment and then me as a shrink. And then we got to a point where we love talking to these like smart, sweary, funny Facebook, Instagram moms. Um, But when I think the part of the breaking point was when in September of this, uh, a year ago, this year, September of this year, actually, um, there was a boy who, killed himself a 15 year old boy and we ended up getting a um uh, instagram this guy named cody taggart he's amazing he's super cute i hit on him all the time um (laughs) because he's like 32 so i think i can do it and call him my boyfriend and he tolerates it but um he's a big mental health advocate because when he was i think when he was 21 he actually had a gun in his mouth and was about to try to kill himself and he something, you know, pulled him out of it. And so he has, he turned to, um, you know, fitness and weight loss and is also a huge inspiration and advocate in the mental health community. And during that interview, I realized that I really wanted to talk more about difficult things. And um, I think her perfect guest was a way to expand her business because she was putting a lot of time into it. Um, and to me, this was more about fulfilling myself than anything Mm. else. Um, it was more about finding my voice. I mentioned to you earlier that I have a, you know, a relative who has attempted suicide many times and her mental health and suicide attempt were always sort of hushed and brushed over and like, um, gently erased as if they didn't happen And um, that day talking about suicide in such an open way, in such an open forum, I really felt like I had found the opportunity to have the voice that I'd been lacking as a child. And so shortly after that, Sharon, my co-host and I broke up, um, but um, we're still the greatest. uh, I mean, she's still one of my favorite people. Uh, my kids love her kids. I, you know, we, I take her kids out to dinner. She takes mine out. We, we did a, a wave date when the quarantine started and walked to her house and like waved to her and her kids at the window. You know, um, it's all on good terms. I think just for me, I had such a need to use this forum to get out my uh, leftover childhood crap, I guess. Um, you know, and so it became about more. Um, today I just published an episode on, uh, well, I was talking to a, a survivor of domestic violence and that's particularly important because now during the pandemic coronavirus, we have shot up with domestic violence because everyone's stuck with each other. Yeah. And, um, and the timing just happened to be perfect, but I, I sort of make it my point to find guests that have, uh, that are brave enough to talk about the things that it's, that we're not supposed to talk about, um, that we're not supposed to talk about because it makes people uncomfortable. Mm. So, um, so I do love my podcast very much and it's, um, it is a great passion and it is currently my self care during this time. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there's something, I guess, um, I, I hate using the word magical, I really do, but there's something, I'll, I'll use your word, fulfilling about doing the podcast. And I mean, this one, I think I've probably said this before to people on the show, it, it, it's selfish for me because um, I went full-time as a writer about a year ago. But one of the mm. things I, I miss is having that connection with people because obviously I spend a lot of time by myself just just writing in a room. So obviously this gives me a platform to meet people like yourself, just have that chat once a week. Um, and a lot of the questions that I, I do ask are quite selfish. Um, but you know, when, when it's, it's your podcast and you're, you're creating those, um, opportunities for people to listen in and learn and I guess, um, learn from those conversations, then you, you are still providing that value back. And it sounds like that's something that your podcast is definitely doing, particularly like you say, for those subjects that are very much, um, unspoken, um, the ones that people feel like they just can't talk about and just shining a light on the stuff that we can improve on. Um, yeah. I know that you mentioned before we got into uh, recording and you mentioned a little bit um, earlier as well about 
the, the 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 concerns and the work that you do for teen suicide. I don't know if you wanted to touch a little bit on that and the kind of stuff that you're doing. Sure. I mean, I um, I'm currently working with a lot of suicidal teens who thankfully have become less suicidal during this uh, pandemic, which is actually not unusual. Um, suicidality also goes down during major wars and uh, 9/11 and Katrina. What's the reason so- for that? Oh, it's, I'm glad you asked. Uh, <laughs> I think it's sort of like, uh, there aren't, if you go to a country with famine, you will have a hard time finding someone who has an eating disorder. And I think it's because um, there's a lot of, you know, if you're struggling to survive, if you see people struggling to survive every day, the idea of killing yourself really takes on a different reason. Hmm. Um, and I think that for, um, there's another part of it where when this whole thing first started, a lot of my patients, when I would check in on them, they'd be like, I'm fine. Like, like this anxiety, this terror, this like fear, this is how I felt my whole life. The only difference is now everyone else is feeling it, you know? Hmm. Um, so I think that when life isn't a given we sort of evaluate it more. And if other people are scared too, we feel closer. Um, And then during wars, well, in particular during World War II, it was interesting because women's mental health went up because they were given a chance to finally, um, you know, be involved. Right. And uh, they weren't as happy when the men came home, but, um, (laughs) you know, but in general, like major disasters do tend to, uh, reduce suicide rates. Uh, the one exception is sort of not exception, but like a caveat is um, Hurricane Katrina. So suicide rates went down a lot, and then um, in the aftermath, they went up a lot because in the very you know scary, um, totally underdeveloped, for lack of a better word, you know, state that they were living in, a lot of people's first reaction was to buy guns. And as it turns out, guns do kill people. Yep, it's guns. Um, So other than Katrina, um, there does tend to be like a nice, a nice little ease off of suicide during these difficult times. So if we're looking for a positive, I guess that could be it. Mm. Absolutely. And, uh, like, like you say, you, I think. Well, I think I interrupted you. You were starting to get onto uh, some of the stuff that you're doing with teen suicide. I mean, I work with teens. I the original um, intent of my my um, uh, book launch was going to be to help promote the idea of hashtag Ten Steps and the Stigma, because all too often I will see extremely well-meaning parents advise their teenagers not to tell the school or grandma or their friends. And what that does is it adds shame, assuming you can keep the secret, or it adds guilt when you break the secret. And at the very least, it provides further isolation. Isolation. It would have been a great sentence if I'd done it correctly. (laughs) Um, It provides further isolation from you and people who might support you. So... Um, I want to bring awareness to it. I want to talk about the need to end the stigma. And uh, my next, the next uh, book that I'm doing is definitely going to be um, related to teen suicide. And I'm, it feels weird saying I'm excited about it, but I am. Um, well, definitely, yeah. I mean, if it's going to, if it's going to help people have some kind of positive impact on people's lives, then Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. So I'm uh, I'm I'm all into that and um mm. and really excited and my kids might even be able to talk me out of a bike ride so that I can do some research. <laughs> that, so. <laughs> yeah. There does seem to be a trend of um I mean we we've, we've discussed to be fair quite a fair few um different cases and different um stigmatized situations in this conversation. It does seem to be that the common thread here is just providing platforms for honest and open transparency. Yeah. Um, I mean, bring this back into to writing as well. Obviously, we, we've spoken a little bit about the journals and putting aside whatever color, whatever size, whatever paper type you want to use. Right. There is something um, cathartic and therapeutic about just writing things down that I think um, can contribute to a lot of people. And I think particularly any writers listening to this, um, I know that myself included, I'm more used to using the keyboard than I am the pen anymore. 
but I, I definitely make time sort of at least once a month or so to sit down for an hour and just do a bit of free writing just to see where it goes. And you'll be surprised what kind of um, stuff comes out, particularly when you, you just start on the flow of writing something and you, you end up just pouring a secret that you, you didn't know you had. This is staring at you on the page. Um, it's quite bizarre. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying for this new book, I'm trying to do the outline in by hand just to see how it goes. Um, it makes me feel sick. <laughs> I'm sorry. My, my, my hand, no, my hand can't do it anymore. I, I, if I try to write freehand for too long, it just, I just get aches now. I can't, not since I've uh, left school can I do that. But uh, best of luck to you. I didn't think of that, but you'll yeah. be fine. <laughs> <laughs> not to, to dissuade you. Um, we are coming up to time. I do have one final major question and then we'll go into a quick fire round. Um, it's a question that I ask every guest, which is why do you write? Oh, uh, because I have to. Um, because I have no choice because there are words in my head that need to get out. And, um, and it's, it's, it took me a while to get comfortable with my voice. So it was my words on paper that I went to first. Beautiful. Okay. So now we are going to go into our quick fire round, which is just 10 questions. I'll throw at you as quickly as possible. Um, they're all just fun. There's nothing there to catch you out. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you on the other side. Are you ready? Ready. Beautiful. Sun or snow? Oh, sun, definitely. What's your favorite quote? Um, my favorite quote is actually the it's it's sort of the entire poem, the Yeats pro- poem, when you are old and gray and sitting by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with a love false or true, but one man loved the pilgrim soul in you. I just want to stop there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I actually still know that from forever ago. And my 11 year old came over to show me a cool poem he had found last week. And it was that. And it was oh, cool. amazing. Oh, full loop. Um, what's your best hobby to pass the time? Uh, I want to say something really clever, but. I don't know. Watching horrible TV. Horrible TV. Yeah. <laughs> Tiger King. Uh, bikes or skateboards? Bikes. Who was the last writer to make you smile? Um, I, well, I love Emily Griffith all, always, but um, I just read The Silent Patient, which was also really good. Not smiley, but good. What's the greatest film of all time? Um. It's probably either uh, Footloose, Grease, or The Day After Tomorrow. Nice. Very different. <laughs> <laughs> Podcasts or audiobooks? Uh, podcasts. What's your dream holiday destination? A tropical island, Mexico. Who's one person you'd love to meet? Hmm. That's a really good one. Um... Uh, there's a man named Christopher Pike who was a writer when I was younger and I don't even know if he's still alive or dead but I read his book so many thousands of times it would have to be him nice what's your favorite board game Scrabble <laughs> beautiful and that's 10 questions there was a <laughs> that did not go the way I expected you I normally favorite quote trips people up but you were quick on that one and then the hobby one is normally quite quick for people to answer and that was the one that stumped you I don't know. Well, I mean, I we also taught our kids to play this this game called Asshole, but we call it A-Man. It's like a college drinking game, but we've adapted it. So we play is that. Is it a card with... game by any chance? Yeah, it is. Yes. It is. You know what I'm talking about? I yeah. I think so, yeah. So we taught them to play that a few years ago. Like, uh, they don't, we don't do the drinking, obviously, but it's uh, <laughs> it's it's actually a pretty fun way to uh, decide who gets to pick a movie or dinner for the night. So nice. I have um, I have played juice pong with my five year old son, which is a take nice. on beer pong. Oh yeah, um, we know. I got yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do have one more question, which for you, which is uh, where can my listeners find out more about yourself and all that you're working on? Of course, uh, you can find me on Instagram at Psych Shrink Mom. You can also find me on Instagram at Neurotic Nourishment. The Neurotic Nourishment podcast is available all places podcasts are, even though 90% of people watch on Spotify or listen on Spotify or Apple. And you can find my book on um, Barnes and Nobles or Amazon. And then we also just release the audiobook for those of you who like audiobooks, but I don't, or no, the ebook, I'm sorry, the ebook we released, but I don't like ebooks, but some people do. <laughs> 
<laughs> beautiful well thank you so much for joining me in the show and i appreciate um how honest and open you've been in sharing everything that's been going on so thank you it's been a pleasure thank you so much for the opportunity no worries and thank you everyone for listening and i will see you next week thanks for listening to this week's episode of the great writer share podcast next week i'll be joined by the best-selling author of horror and dark fiction drew starling don't forget you can get early access to every episode of the great writer share podcast and the chance to ask upcoming guests any of your questions just by becoming a patron of the show all you need to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash great writer share and support the show for as little as one dollar a month one more time that's www.patreon.com forward slash great writer share until next time. <laughs>